Dude's house. We're going to Vegas. You are locked on Cougs. Your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs Daily Podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach Parker Antroth. Here to break down all things Cougs. And whether you're a Houston fan or just a hater who came to step by, thank you for making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. Appreciate you making us your first listen each and every day here at Locked On Cougs. If you want to join the conversation but don't know what to say, tell us in the comments down below. How do you eat a Kit Kat? Don't tell me you just bite right into it. That That's the wrong answer. Today's episode's got a lot to do with basketball. We're talking about Jamal Shedd and the pro prospect going on there and kind of why I'm intrigued by some of that more than others in the second and third segments. But first, I want to talk some about uh, the news that came out on Wednesday, and that is that Houston has an opponent in the Las Vegas Players Era Invitational, and that opponent is Alabama. Now, I want to start by saying uh, I was originally going to record this episode and talk some for Wednesday. Had some internet issues on Tuesday night. Could not do it. And in the interim, this news popped up. So I'm kind of glad I got to lump this into a basketball episode because it is interesting to look at how this takes place and takes shape. Um, Amongst the teams at the Invitational, Houston is uh, joining Alabama, obviously Notre Dame, Oregon, Rutgers, San Diego State, and Texas A&M at the event in Las Vegas. Teams will each get a million dollars to distribute amongst uh, the players for NIL purposes based on some NIL kind of things. And Houston is scheduled to play Alabama in the um, the like marquee primetime matchup the first night. Um I will say that it's interesting to see this. Um, I, you know, big picture, Houston is three and three against Alabama all time. Um, the all time score is four hundred and seventy six to four hundred and seventy eight. Bad guys on the end of that one, but it is also going to be the third time Houston has played Alabama in four years. The third time Kelvin Sampson has coached against Nate Oates in this matchup in four years. Both programs have had really incredible uh, growth in the last half decade. And frankly, it's interesting to me to go back and reflect at, reflect on kind of how these programs have met with each other. Right. So in 2022, uh, Houston traveled to Tuscaloosa coming off of a final four uh, season before, uh, and it was kind of a national, like, eyes on Marcus Sasser kind of game. In the final full run, obviously, you had Quentin and Ladiki and other guys involved, right? And so, December of 21, coming off of the final four, going to Tuscaloosa, uh, SEC country for this, you know, little old American athletic conference team, right? Uh, Sasser showed up, Sasser showed out, had 25 points, played 39 minutes, played impeccable defense. Houston did come up on the short side of that one, uh, 82 to 83. But um, I thought it was interesting in that matchup. Houston stood toe to toe with Alabama while having three different players in the starting lineup under six foot three. Uh, Jamal played just 29 minutes, Kyler Edwards played just 22 minutes, Sasser played the 39 I mentioned. Um, but on the whole, a young Jamal, a veteran Kyler, and a young Sasser kind of steered the ship in that one. Uh, Tremont played some as well as a true freshman. Come off the bench, had 18 minutes, uh, did not score in that contest. We'll talk more about Tremont in a second. But that one was an interesting game for the na- nation to see. Like This was not a one-hit Final Four wonder, right? You, you and I knew that, but the nation got to see that in a way that I don't know that they did before. Even in a loss, Houston was very impressive. Right. Fast forward to 2022-23. Houston is the number one team in America at that point. December of 22. Um, you know, 
coming off of a couple years of deep playoff, uh, the deep final, the deep, deep March Madness runs, a uh, big time recruit in Jarris Walker, Marcus Sasser coming back instead of going pro, and Houston at home as number one team in the country had a big lead early in this game, um, early in that game. I should say Jamal Shedd kind of led the way in this one, had 19 points, a big dunk that felt like an exclamation point to the nation at the time. Alabama had projected top five pick Brandon Miller. Houston smothered him, right? Like on the whole, this felt like Houston was really taking uh, the reins of the country. I mean, at the time, Alabama came into Houston uh, also in the top 10 uh, by the end of the season, they'd spent time as the number one team in the country. People knew they were good, right? Um, and, and honestly, that game kind of turned on its head when Houston was beating Alabama by, you know, it was like 16 or 18 at that point. And Alabama and NATO's just put the subs in. They just needed to like reset for a second. And they put four guys who averaged less than f- uh, 14 minutes per game in and kind of flipped the script. Houston didn't have a game plan necessarily. They played a little bit different offense from a scheme perspective, and the comeback started. And then the starters kind of finished the job for them at Alabama. That that interesting back and forth there. Um, Jamal Shedd had 19 points. I mentioned uh, Tremont would come back up. Tremont had 10, and there's only two guys in Houston that had points in double figures in that were double figures for Houston in that game. Uh, Brandon Miller was without a field goal in that game. He had eight points, but they were all at the foul line. Um, the game was kind of about the you know quote unquote others, right? And it's interesting to see how that goes. And now, after a year off of playing each other in 2023 24, um, Houston heads to Vegas to see Nate Oates and the Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide are coming off their own Final Four run. Um, and while the rest of the schedule is not set, it is interesting to see this matchup as familiar foes and coaching styles, right? At this point, I think it's safe to say that uh, oh, who's in his late 40s, I believe. He's still on the earlier side of his coaching career. He's a uh, head coach, I believe, at Buffalo before this, right? Um, early side of his coaching career, um, but very well established already as creating something strong in Alabama versus Kelvin Sampson, who's kind of in the opposite, right? He's built up programs before and is kind of on the back nine to say the least. Uh, and eventually, you know, he's handed over to Kellen at some point, right? The way that this back and forth goes is interesting. They both know each other pretty well, coaching these marquee games before. And it's a chance to once again, put the Cougs and the tide on front street for the country to watch um the rest schedule as far as who houston will be playing is not out yet they did put out some of the first round first uh weekend first night first day first round they haven't talked about the bracket necessarily yet uh matchups Rutgers play notre dame creighton and oregon a and m and san diego state the only stipulation uh, as far as who you can and can't play is a non bracket play game cannot be between two teams from the same conference. Um, but Houston's in the big 12. There's no other big 12 team there. The only thing that would stipulate is that as far as setting up non bracket play games, you're not going to have a and M and Alabama playing each other. And so that kind of means that other things might get moved around to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, I'm excited about Vegas. I'm excited about going to the Players Area Invitational uh, as a, as the Cougs it is in the middle of uh, my coaching season as well as uh, around Thanksgiving time and all of that. So we'll see if the actual trip to Las Vegas happens or if we're watching on TV together. Um, I will say this is another moment where you're saying of the teams on this docket, Houston and Alabama could both be in the top five by the time this thing rolls around. Um, I don't think it's any accident when you look at the rest of the teams in this that they're being you know, told they're going to guarantee a game against one another. Creighton's been good in the past. Rutgers has had some guys. We saw a and twice last season. We know that they're impressive. If San Diego State had a, a championship appearance a couple years ago. But on the whole here, 
the programs to look at are Houston, Alabama, and they're playing one another on the opening night. And, and I think that that's, again, another sign of where this program has gone. Now, I say all that to say that one of the guys that built this program up is Jamal Shedd. Jamal Shedd is in the NBA draft. And on Tuesday, there was some draft scuttlebutt about people talking about where he could go, where he could fall, where he could rise. And it, I don't think it's right. So we're going to talk about that in a second. But before we get to that, we're also going to mention that if you are looking for anything to go watch this summer, right? Summer League basketball, uh, you know, the, the basketball tournament coming through Houston, the Astros, comedy shows, theater, concerts, whatever you're looking for, you're going to need a ticket. And the best place to get that ticket is Game Time. You got to download the Game Time app today, get the lowest prices guaranteed. They have all kinds of different things to make sure you know you're getting the best deal, right? They got flash deals, zone deals, last minute deals as the event gets closer, uh, all in pricing, no tricky stuff, right? I like that they can give you a view from your section row for that event, for that venue, uh, so that way you know like what's in your way, what you're getting into, what you're looking at, where the artists will be stationed or whatever, right? It's all kinds of the information you need to make sure you're getting the best deal possible. Plus, if you're worried about other people having different prices, they will give you 110% in credit of the difference if you can find a ticket in the same row and section cheaper somewhere else it's the best deal going check out the game time app download the game time app today and use code locked on college for 20 dollars off your first purchase turns play again it's code locked on college l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-c-o-l-l-e-g-e -E -E for 20 dollars off your first purchase download game today lowest prices best tickets lowest prices care run teeth Got excited there and tripped a little bit up the end, but I will say game time is a great place to be looking at tickets for some baseball this summer. Um, so I, I started the episode by saying, if you missed the announcement, that um, on Tuesday night, recording for Wednesday, internet was a big issue at our household, so didn't get to the show. And I wanted to talk a lot, like a show's worth, about Jamal. Got a lot of notes here looking at his NBA draft potential. And that's all started because a lot of people in the NBA draft circles, because highlight reels from Gavoni were being circulated or whatever um, on X and Instagram and things like that, um, people were talking about where he gets drafted. And people were saying, oh, if my team finds him at 45, or oh, if my team finds him at 38, or my. And I finally responded to one that I know. Um, Brad runs some Houston Rockets content, like the Brad Paolo Will. If you're on X, it's hard to miss those guys and Houston Rockets stuff. He mentioned that he'd love to have him fall to Houston at 43. and You can't let him get past. Got to keep him in town from that effect. And my response was, he shouldn't fall out of the top 30. And then I admitted that, like, some people are like, the top 30? And I'm like, no, I, I'm trying to admit that I got a little bias here. I would take him much higher than 30th. But I don't understand the guy's not a first-round pick. And so... I, I do a little diving here, and I'm probably doing this once or twice more with more depth and detail as we keep going because the draft is a big deal. Um, but Jamal is like the face and culture of this program, and I just don't like that he's not getting a fair shake. And so I looked at the big things here with him and the NBA draft, and the biggest thing is the measurable stuff, right? Um, and so if you look at his comps, uh, the most common comps you got are J uh, Javon Carter, a guy from six uh, one guy from she said he was six one. I think he's really six foot and change, and then put shoes on um, from West Virginia. Also a national defense player of the year, um, taken uh, in the second round, thirty second picks, uh, second pick in the second round. Um, he was the sixth point guard taken, but that was in the same draft as like Luka Doncic, Trey Young, Shea Gilgis Alexander right in 2018 and frankly um yeah, there was a big window there where like those three i mentioned luca trey and shea were all like the early lottery and then there weren't really point cards until like the end of the first round start of the second round right um for what it's worth that was the 2018 draft and we're you know 
multiple contracts later, Javon Carter is still playing. He played 15 minutes per game this year, um, started half the season uh, at last year for Milwaukee um, and played over 22 minutes per game for them. Um, and, and I think they're very comparable players, both hyper defensive guards um, that do a great job getting you the basketball back. They do it a little differently. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, he he's playing on a third contract for another team and still starting and playing a lot of games this late in his career. And he was picked at the beginning of the second round in a really good NBA draft with a lot of other really good point guards, right? Um, in, in 2021, another comp is Davian Mitchell. We saw Davian Mitchell up close in a person right, Davion Mitchell, um, from Baylor. He was taken in the top 10. Now, a big difference here is that Davion's three-point percentage is much higher, or was much higher in college. And so, theoretically, right, it's a little bit different offensive skill set, uh, whereas Jamal actually scored the ball better on the whole in a couple different analytical perspectives. They were all much closer to the rim. He, had, he attacked the basket, right? Um, but Davion went ninth overall, and he was the fourth point guard taken in a very point guard heavy class. For what it's worth, though, as the fourth point guard taken, Davion Mitchell was the only short one. The three bef- ahead of him, uh, Cade Cunningham, Jalen Suggs, and Josh Giddy, were all six five or taller, right? And so again, like a very different type of guard. And and yes. He had a really big three point jump in his three point percentage his final year at Baylor, but his NBA three point percentage across his career since 2021 been a couple of years now. I think it's safe to say that stabling out, stabilized or evening out, um, is much more like his first couple of years of college, and so I, he's been extended uh, in his contract, and so I think it's safe to say that you know he he's he's kind of what you could expect to get out of. Jamal and he was a top 10 pick and they picked him for what it's worth. And you could say what you want about the Sacramento Kings to play alongside Darren Fox and Lake monk. Um, and he played 27 and a half minutes a game as a rookie with Fox healed and Halliburton as other guards in the roster. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't understand how you can see the success of guys like that in more recent years and not think, okay, Jamal's got a chance. Right, other comps are like Jose Alvarado, who's undrafted but obviously had his fair share of success. Um, Jalen Brunson, as far as like impactful offensively, very different offensive player, obviously, but it's Brunson's listed at 6'2. So, um, but I look at these guys and I see a bunch of guys that I think in a redraft or a you know, looking back at the draft or whatever, um, all should have gone higher. And all remind you of Jamal Shedd. And as I watch this, I can't not think Jamal's just going to do this next. Now, here's the big issue uh, with not taking Jamal in the first round. The big issue with not taking Jamal Shedd in the first round is that it really will impact in a big kind of way Jamal Shedd's career earnings, right? Now, I don't think there's any way he goes undrafted, but obviously undrafted is a whole other beast. I, myself, would take him as the first player off the board under six foot three. I don't understand how anyone in their draft board would have someone else under six foot three ahead of Jamal Shedd this NBA draft. If you want the big six six wing, that's what you want. If you want the big seven footer, that's what you want. And that's not what Jamal is. But as far as getting someone under six, three to help you win basketball games, there's no one better than Jamal shed in this draft. And the more I dive into it, again, I'm going to dive into it a couple more times, probably between now and the draft. Um, Jamal, if you want to come on and talk about it, let me know. I do. I just, I don't know why anyone else would be taken ahead of him. That's un, in the same class and we see guys under 6'3 succeed in this league all the time Jalen Brunson um, not the same type of first of all nowhere near the defender Jamal is and not the same type of offensive player right Jamal Shedd is much more of a point guard 
than an off-ball guard. Jalen Brunson is much more of a scorer than a point guard, right? But Jalen Brunson carried the Knicks the last two years. Jalen Brunson, for what it's worth, was pretty impactful on the Dallas Mavericks uh, Western Conference Finals run a couple years ago, right before he became a Nick, right? And I think that goes to show that guys under 6'2 can still impact basketball games. The outliers here uh, that would help Jamal's case, right, would be like Kyle Lowry was a first-round pick. Uh, it was in the 20s. I want to say 24. Um Kyle Lowry, obviously, still in the league today. It's like it, it's been a long time. I want to say it's like sixteen years, seventeen years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fred Van Vliet, undrafted Wichita State guy, obviously still in the league. So with the Houston Rockets, right? And um, played a lot of contracts. I won a lot of basketball games. Won a title. Lowry and Van Vliet both won a title with Toronto, right? They had both of them, right? Uh, clearly impacted winning if you put the right stuff around it. Um, and then the the biggest outlier, I think, of the 21st century is going to be Chris Paul. Chris Paul was a top five pick in 2005. And unless he makes an announcement, at, you know, as of recording this podcast, he is still playing pro basketball, right? Like, um, I have to, and frankly, it was all whatever MVP finalist, um, all star bajillion times, all that, right? Um, Jamal can have the same kind of impact as those guys. And I think the indicators for people need to be things like, um, uh, his, you know, he won defense player of the year at, at six foot tall for the nation. Um, but I think the bigger thing is that like, okay, that's college basketball. You can maybe think, Oh, it's this year for college basketball. It's that year for college basketball. He also had some of the fastest times in any of the drills at the NBA combine. He also had all the same write-ups and reports out of the NBA combine scrimmages. Like this guy's the best defender on the floor. He also controlled the pace of playing offense in those games where it was like, oh my God, this guy can orchestrate an offense even when no one is running an offense kind of guy. Like he does those kinds of things too. It's not just the accolades from this past season where he had the gigantic leap and took over the program at, you know, Marcus comes on and it's his turn or whatever. Right. Um, I'm obviously making the case. I think it's first round pick. Um, the big difference here is if you look at like contracts, the, the first round thing is important and it's important because, um, and last NBA draft, the last pick of the first round was a guy out of Missouri named Kobe Brown. He signed a four-year, $12.4 million contract. Um, Kobe Brown is not a guy you've heard of a whole lot. He had a couple fun tournament games, March Madness games between the conference tournament and the NCAA tournament last year. But last pick in the first round, $12.4 million. The 31st pick, so 30th Kobe Brown, the 31st pick, first pick of the second round, James Najee did not sign a contract. He went to sprint to summer ball, played some in the summer, and got the boot, and it's not in the NBA, right? Um, the 38th pick, also made by the Celtics for what it's worth, um, Jordan Walsh, uh, he signed a four-year, $7.5 million deal. Uh, he has the high, he has the, he is the first player of the second round, you know, the eighth pick of the second round, uh, to sign a guaranteed contract. 3.2 of that 7.6 is guaranteed. Some of that's also a signing bonus. So I guess you probably lump that on the same money. And then some of it's in the fourth season, which is a club option. Um, that's a gigantic, gigantic difference, right? The 30th pick, the final pick in the first round, $12.4 million. If Jordan Walsh does not play in an NBA game as the 38th pick, he's got $3.2 uh, million. And he's lucky to get that based on the guys drafted around him, right? I understand that even a G League guy, even a European guy, they'll all get good livings. And it's playing basketball, and it's a blessing to get to play and, and all that. But in terms of NBA career, we see time and time again, there's guys in the Mavericks and Celtics playing the NBA Finals over here to my right that are, you know, on rosters because GMs put value in, okay, we we spent a first-round pick on this guy. 
We got to make sure we, you know, we're, we're, we're guaranteed contract. We're paying this guy. Let's see what we can get out of the contract, right? Those kinds of movements really do happen. That type of politicking, unfortunately, really does happen. Being the 31st pick versus being the 30th pick is a big deal. Now, I think NBA teams are hip to it. I think Jamal Shedd is going to sneak into the back half of that first round. And again, I personally, and I stress this because people on Twitter, I don't think seem to listen to this part. I personally would not take a player over six, under six foot three ahead of him. I don't think I would take a point guard in college basketball from last season ahead of him. I'd have to double check, but off the top of my head, I'm not right. Um, Jamal is going to help whatever team he's on win basketball games. Uh, he's, He's tough as nails. He will defend like all get out. And frankly, when he's in there, he can run an offense and attack the rim. Um, we're going to break more of the way the offensive game translates later. I want to have a draft person on to talk about it. Um, but on the whole, I just I saw that draft talk um, on on Tuesday, and I just didn't understand why the conversation is, I hope we get him at insert pick after number 40. The guy should go in the 20s at the latest. And I, I just, I continue to be baffled by the way that this goes because then we'll sit up and look up in a couple of years like, oh my goodness, who would have known about Fred Van Vliet? And it's like, did you watch Wichita State play? Right, Final Four team, Wichita State. Did you watch them play? Right, um, it it feels like that's what's happening, to Jamal, right here. And before people go off and off, and I know this is a lot of NBA talk, but it, it pertains to Jamal, and he's near and dear. Um, when you look at the 2024 draft, a lot of people are writing it off because there's no Victor Wembanyama, there's no Zion Williamson, there's no I don't know consensus top one, two, three pick, right? And so people are writing it off is not a good draft. The last draft, I remember being a very large consensus on that about, uh, contained two guys named Giannis Antetokounmpo and Nikola Jokic. Uh, between them, they have five NBA MVPs. I think there are good players in this draft. I think it's just not super obvious. And I think it's just the kind of good players that take some research, like watching some American Athletic Conference tape from the last couple of years or watching that team in Houston that – got hurt in the sweet 16 um I, th I think that's what it takes and it's unfortunate that's what it takes but i think that's where we are um I, I really do enjoy talking about this kind of stuff with jamal because I, I i think that it's important um we can talk later at some point about it being important to the program and that kind of stuff too that's neither here nor there at this moment what is here and there is that jamal is in the immediate draft and we're excited for it and we're hoping for the best um, again, I don't think I would take anyone unless I was taking a different position because I needed that or something ahead of him. But that's, I guess, apparently just me. Locked on Cougs, obviously a top end Jamal, uh, number one Jamal Shed fan podcast, but also here for your Houston Cougar news each and every day. Locked on Cougs is uh, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. It's your team, our Houston Cougars, Jamal Sheds, forever Houston Cougars each and every day. Go Cougs.